Hello, everyone. I'm here today with Adele Ravella, who is the CEO of Buyer Persona Institute and author of Buyer Personas, How to Gain Insight into Your Customers' Expectations, Align Your Marketing Strategies, and Win More Business. And her book was recently named a top five business book by Fortune Magazine. Adele's unique perspective derives from decades of experience as a sales and marketing executive, trainer, researcher, and entrepreneur. And today we are going to be talking about buyer personas, why they are important, and how to use them. Adele, how are you doing today? Well, I'm I'm doing great today, Dave. Thanks for, so much for inviting me. This is uh, this is an ex excellent chance for me to get to talk about my favorite topic. Yeah, no problem. And thank you for writing that book. <laughs> I've uh, I've read through it twice now. So I uh, I uh, as I told you earlier, I'm personally super excited to uh, talk with you today and, and uh, really pick your brain. And I said, well, who, who better to talk about buyer personas than the person who uh, who wrote uh, buyer personas? <laughs> so uh, very very excited to dig into everything with you today. And uh, and I know our listeners are, are um, going to gain a lot. And um, it's a I know this is a hot topic right now as well. So very very excited. So uh, to kind of just dig right in. Uh, let's kind of go down to uh, the very basic level uh, and just start okay. off by having you explain what a buyer persona is. Well, it, it's an example of the real buyers. So it's a, an aggregate or example or composite of the real buyers that you want to influence through your sales and marketing efforts. Uh, and, you know, and that's a, a pretty – straightforward idea, uh, what, where people get in trouble with buyer personas is around how they build those personas. But, but the idea of having an example buyer is, is, is about being able to understand what your buyers care about, what they're thinking about, so that when we engage in sales and marketing interactions with the buyers that we, um, we're more uh, understanding that the, our activities and our actions are based on a deep and clear understanding of what buyers expect from us and mm -hmm. how that engagement would be productive for the buyer as well as for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I think a lot of confusion, and part of me thinking this way is because of my own personal confusion over the years with what a true buyer persona is versus um, – Basically, I think what's mainly called a buyer uh, profile, if I'm not mistaken, you know, job title, demographics, you know, all that stuff, because I know that it goes into it, but that doesn't complete the picture. So um, let's really kind of have you clarify the difference between what people traditionally thought what a buyer persona is, because you used to only, when I say, you know, as of early as a couple, couple years, if not even sooner than that, when I read about this stuff, that's really what you would get, especially with all the big data and all that stuff. You would just get this buyer persona is what people would call them, but it would mainly just be the traditional buyer profiles. So can you dig into the, what some of the main differences are between you know, a true buyer persona versus a buyer profile? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Dave. And, and the key is that um, a buyer profile describes the person and may go into, you know, varying degrees of depth around that person's, um, any of the attributes of those people. So, you know, depending on whether it's B2B or B2C, may go into in-depth about that person's um, psychographics, you know, like how do they think, what do they care about, uh, what are their goals, their priorities, their concerns, their education. If it's B2C, they tend to get into income. That's well and good. But if you think about what I said a minute ago about the purpose of a buyer persona is to help us to understand how our sales and marketing interactions um, should be designed, then we start to see that that's insufficient, that it's, if we just profile the person, we're, we're missing the key element, which is uh, the part of the buyer persona that tells us how, when, and why buyers start to engage with the idea that they should buy whatever it is we're selling or marketing. Mm -hmm. And and so if we, you know, we're, my concern, the reason I wrote the book, because I, I never really set out, like I wanted to be a, an author someday, but I wrote the book because I was deeply concerned that 
we were we were getting all these buyer profiles out there, and that people weren't going to get any enough value from them. Uh, so it's not a bad idea to have a buyer profile, but it's just a little tiny piece of what we need to know. And the more important uh, thing we under, need to understand is is really getting into the mindset of the buyer through the time that they're making the buying decision that we want to influence. Mm -hmm. So basically, buyer persona, a true buyer persona, and I keep saying it that way because buyer persona used to be synonymous with buyer profile, what we consider now a buyer profile. So to get a true buyer persona is basically your buyer profile, which are the you know, job title, size of company possibly, demographic, you know, all, all the traditional stuff, plus how they came to their buying decisions, their, you know, what they, you know, the journey they took, uh, what was really important to them, how, why, all that good stuff. Is, is that kind of uh, summing up in a nutshell of what you're saying, basically? Right. So we, in, we, we think that there are five insights that you need to have in addition to the buyer profile. And mm -hmm. those insights, uh, which, you know, I think we'll probably go to, into here in a minute, uh, allow us to, to sort of peek inside the heads or the mindset or the expectations that buyers have as they're going through this, this, this very specific decision around buying something mm -hmm. that we want to market to them. And, mm -hmm. and, if you, it, and you, when you think about the objective that I stated for buyer personas a minute ago, around being able to figure out how to design our sales and marketing activities and be more effective and actually win their this buyer's business. Um, it, you know, I, I always like to say, you know, a CEOs of big companies probably buy vacations for their families and home improve, you know, improve their homes, and they also have to approve, you know, huge capital investments for their companies. Now, clearly what we need to know about them changes depending on which of those things we're trying to sell or market to them. Mm -hmm. And and so it isn't enough to just know that the CEO of the company is, you know, wants to grow its business and, you know, wants to get a better job someday in a bigger company and wants to earn more stock or, or, or retire early. You know, all of those things are okay to know, mm -hmm. but now we've got to go sell him a swimming pool or yeah. – we have to go sell him some capital equipment to help his company grow faster. And clearly there's something different we need to know about that CEO mm -hmm. depending on what we're trying to market to him right now. Or her. I hear you. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so um, to kind of put it in, in, in context as far as aligning sales and marketing, basically as far as aligning marketing is, you know, the messages you're sending out, if you're into content marketing, what you'll be writing about, um, you know, if you're retargeting with banner ads, you know, what's truly this, the thing that the, you know, feature benefit that got really got their attention to have you want to talk to them. And then on the other side of that coin, have sales actually also concentrate on those things that you discover because you might think something's important, but the reality is something else was actually even more important. Is that is that a fair statement? Yeah, and, and you know, the, the remarkable part of this is that, you know, as, as a career marketer myself, I've sat in countless meetings sort of reverse engineering the benefit statement, you know, our messages, our core messages, our value prop, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. based on the value and even maybe the unique value, you know, sort of our competitive differences and the things we do. And at the end of the day, we, end, we finally end up agreeing on something we're going to talk about. Uh, but the problem with all of that is there's a missing piece of data in that room is as we're looking at all those benefits and all those capabilities and even what's unique about our product, which of those really factor into our buyer's decision? Uh -huh. and, and does the buyer really care about that part that's unique? You know, we've done yeah. studies where we had to go and tell the company, we know that you're really good at XYZ over here, but, you know, your buyers aren't really thinking about that. That isn't really a, something that matters to them. And if you talk about that all the time, they're just going to they're gonna ignore you because it isn't important to them. 
I bet you you've saved people lots of headaches <laughs> because it just wouldn't be so much easier for people to be talking about what's important to them, right? So yeah, I, I'm sure you're beloved by many companies because I, I can I can only imagine how much that's helped people to get that clarity. And, just and the from buyers the too. Side, I mean, yeah. the, I always I sometimes I wonder whether we're doing this for the vendors or the suppliers or the buyers because <laughs> you know it's so. If you spend as many hours as we do on the phone listening to buyers talk about these decisions, you'd realize how frustrated they are with their inability to get useful information uh, through any, from anything we're doing. And, you know, as I look at content marketing and the practices around content marketing, and there's plenty of data being published about, you know, how much content is wasted and so forth, you know, I, I it's, it's just – is so clear to me that if we'd stop and listen to what the buyers want, we'd realize that it isn't really whether we're doing, you know, whether we're on YouTube or whether we're in spending more time on LinkedIn or banner ads or whatever, it's what we're saying in those places. Yep. Because if we're, not, if we're not delivering useful information to buyers that helps them know and have confidence that they're making a good buying decision, then they're going to they're just going to look elsewhere. They're going to go to their peers, they're going to go to reviews and they're going to ignore everything we're saying as suppliers. And you've wasted lots of time, energy and money in the process. Yeah. Yeah, yeah might, might as well have been just sleeping in, right? <laughs> Instead I, of going to all that trouble. Yeah, I I always say that part of the reason that I got good at this process is because I got so tired uh of sitting in meetings and trying to make this stuff up. And that's why my book is dedicated to every marketer who questions the wisdom of making stuff up. Uh, and that's really the dedication. And it, it's because that is just so much harder than stopping and listening to what buyers want and working off of what they tell us. You know, I find that making stuff up is really hard work. No. No, I hear you. If you have your direction, everything is just a hundred times easier. I mean, w without a doubt. Now, our buyer persona is mainly for like a B2B or a B2C company. Is there yeah, a difference? So, yeah. Well, you know, we that's interesting because when I went to write the book, my background is mostly in B2B. It's in the it's in the high tech sector. We but now we do work for B2C companies. And what we just what I realized when I started really looking at what we do, it doesn't matter whether it's a B2B or B2B or B to C, sorry, it doesn't matter whether you're selling to consumers or to uh, businesses. What matters is the amount of consideration your buyer gives to that decision. So as long as the buyer is investing days, weeks, months, or longer in evaluating their options, weighing the strengths and weaknesses of each, then we can uh, interview those buyers and have them tell us what factored into that decision. So, you know, I'd like to say if, if you stop someone outside the grocery store, and you could try this if you wanted, Dave, and ask them, you know, look in, or look in their shopping cart as you're waiting in, in line at the grocery store and say, hey, I see that you bought, uh, you know, Dasani water, and you, uh, did you notice that Crystal Spring was also on the shelves? You know, what, <laughs> what factored into your decision? To buy yeah. Dasani versus, you know, Crystal Spring. And I guarantee you, you know, they'll either call for security or just <laughs> turn around and ignore you. <laughs> and, You're setting me up to get beat up. Yeah, yeah, so don't do that, Dave. But, but <laughs> on, the, on the other hand, if we have a buyer, and we'll take our CEO, who's deciding where to go to take his family on a big vacation, uh, we could conduct an interview with, with him or her about that and really get some insight into what everything that factors into that choice, why they decided now the time was going on a vacation, um, how they decided where to go, how they chose between all the different hotels and, you know, destination options that were available to them. We could get some insight. And mm -hmm. the, at the same time, if, if that CEO was involved in a big capital investment for the company, um, maybe they're buying, you know, a new – um, supply chain management system for the firm or something, then we could certainly have another kind of conversation and get to those insights. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not B2B or B2C, because I just gave you a consumer example and a business example. It's about the amount of time 
and investment the buyer makes in, in even thinking through those options so that we can have a valid conversation with them and get the insight about what factors into that decision. Gotcha. So as long as there's, you know, a, de a good amount of time and consideration that goes into whatever purchasing decision it is, that's where you come to realize the, the value of a buyer persona. I think you've explained that very, very clearly, very clearly. Yeah, I, I, um, you, you, you explained it very well in the book as well, but I, I think you, you really gave a Cliff Notes version that um, paints a really clear picture about that. So it's for B2B or B2C, just depends on how hard uh, or how much goes into a buying decision. So, okay, I'm sold. You need buyer okay. per personas, right? <laughs> now, what's the first steps that one needs to go through to complete a buyer persona? Do you, and do you start with general information? Yeah, well, you, the, the way to get these insights is to talk to real buyers who have made the decision and ask them to tell you their story. Uh, if, if we... You know, it's really interesting when, when marketers think about doing this sort of work, they tend to either turn to their internal experts or, the, or maybe their current customers or, or possibly some kind of an online survey or a, a script. Um, and all of those things are going to give you inadequate insight into something that would really change the game for you as a sales and marketing professional. So the way to change that game is to do something, you know, step out of the box a little bit. And this is, this is the other reason why I wrote the book is I wanted to, you know, unlike what I could ever do in a podcast, you know, in, a, in talking to you for 30 or 45 minutes, um, there's a lot to know about how to do this correctly. But the short version of the story is, is that we need to get people on the phone who represent our buyer persona in terms of, you know, the target market, so they're the right size company or the right, uh, in the right industry or uh, maybe they're, you know, in the right, have the right job titles and who have within the last year participated in the buying decision we want to influence. And now we can get them on the phone and we can have them tell us their story and from beginning to end, every single thing they did and thought about as they went through that real decision. And uh -huh. if we do this without a script, and this is what's hard, I mean, the most frequently asked question I'll anticipate it is, send me the script, Adele. And I'm going to say that that is the absolute wrong approach. Uh -huh. Because if we write a script, or if we write a survey, or if we you know, jot down questions we're going to ask, we're only going to get answers to the questions we think are important. And besides uh -huh. that, we're going to bore the bore our poor person that we're interviewing to death. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but, you know, I hang up the phone when people call me with surveys. You know, I'm like, I don't want to. But if somebody wants to hear my story, if I just spent days, weeks, months, or years agonizing over a decision, and, and somebody gets on the phone with me and says, you know, take me back to the day when you first decided that now was the time you absolutely had to, you know, upgrade this technology in your company and tell me what happened mm -hmm. and then then that person and it, the more you and, and the trick then is to probe on their answers ask good follow questions based on what they hear and it's just like meeting someone at a party that you don't know and they don't show up with like a script of questions they're going to ask you they just if you've ever met somebody who was just fascinating to talk to it's probably because they were interested in your story, in what you had mm -hmm. to say, and they didn't just talk about themselves. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, no, I, I I hear you. I mean, and I don't I don't see how you could really, you know, get everything out with, with any sort of script. I think, I think in your book you mentioned there's only one script you use, and it's the opening question, which is what you you uh, kind of repeated right now, which is just take me back to the day when you first you know, realize you had a need, you know, what was going on, that sort of stuff that basically breaks the ice. So, so in getting started, to kind of circle back around, it's basically just uh, set up some conversations with people who, you know, your current clients that, that have bought something, you know, hopefully within the last 12 months or so. And, that, and that's basically where you start. And with that, you'll be getting a lot of the general information just right off the bat. So it's not about starting with that. It's about just starting with your clients. Is, is that what I'm hearing? Well, I would worry about just starting with your clients. 
So okay. if you're going to do that, make sure, first of all, that there are people that have just recently purchased. Uh-huh. And then don't, don't just interview the people who chose you. I, the most important insights you're going to get are from choosing, interviewing people who didn't choose you. So uh-huh. people who chose your competitors. Uh, because if you think about it, we're trying to learn how we can get better at sales and marketing. And the people who chose us, we must have done an okay job with them. You know, we, we did it pretty much right. I mean, we might learn, we're going to learn something. We're going to learn what we did right. That's a good thing to know. Uh-huh. And we might even get some, a little bit of, well, it would have been better if you'd done it this way or that way. Uh-huh. But the best insight is going to come from talking to people who didn't choose us, who somehow inside their brains that came to the conclusion, despite all evidence to the contrary that we presented to them, they came to the conclusion that our competitors had a better approach. Uh-huh. And uh, these are where you're going to get the real insight. Yeah, now, now what if you're just getting started, though? What if you're, you're like, man, I have this great idea, I'm starting this company, but one thing I don't have are, you know, any clients, let alone any deals we've lost or anything. Well, what would one do in that situation? Well, then it's it's a little bit it's a little bit trickier, and you may want to get a professional involved in helping you with this. But then, what you need to do is you need to get um, a, a recruiting partner. We call it there if you do a Google search on qualitative research recruiters, you'll find companies who specialize in setting up phone interviews for you, or they also will, will you know, usually have like some kind of a focus group center. You don't want to do that. But they will set up phone interviews with you. But now you have to be careful about giving that recruiter a set of criteria for those interviews that matches your target buyer. Because you know, when, you, when we work with our win-loss list, we, we've got a sort of a built-in assurance that when we say, take me back to the day when you first decided to evaluate a solution, we know that that represents our target market. Those are the people who considered us, and we probably want to keep considering us. When we go to a recruiter, we have to be very careful uh, about how we define that, especially we have to give them all the attributes, and we want to talk to companies of this size and so forth. We have to know our target market with respect Mm -hmm. to the demographics and the job titles, but now we also have to be Tell the recruiter to screen uh, for phone for interviews for us with people who have made this buying decision within the last year, uh-huh. and uh, this is where we have to do a lot of coaching with our clients to help them define that question in a way that isn't confusing to buyers, where we don't get sort of people into the interviews who really didn't understand what we were talking about. Um, uh-huh. As vendors, we get so caught up in our own sort of language and jargon around how we describe our solutions, and it's, it's fascinating in and of itself just to see what happens when you take that out and you put it in a in a script and you give it to a, a recruiting partner, and they show up with people who thought you meant something else altogether. They were just yeah. confused about that. But that's how so we it do sounds, it. It sounds a little trickier, but it can be done. It can Absolutely. Be done. We do it every day. It's just that it's going to require more skill. And I do talk about it in the book, working yes. with qualitative research recruiters. Yeah. Yes. Now, I, I'm not sure, you know, with everything we've been saying, I'm not really even sure this applies, or I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on it. But, you know, in the last five years or so, you know, the word big data has um, been a big word. <laughs> and,. Uh, you know, from what you're saying, I'm not really, you know, I'm not sure how much it plays a part or if it does. Um, can you talk about that? Because there's been lots of people, you know, to, to get down, and again, they would call it to get your buyer persona um, is what all you read about from all this big data. Now, of course, it's only going to, you know, this is only going to apply to, you know, bigger companies that have lots of data um, points to um, to utilize. But how, how much does big data play in all this, if at all? Yeah, well, the part I've just been talking about to just now with getting inside your buyer's story about how, when, and why they make decisions, you're not going to uh-huh. get that from big data. Uh-huh. Um, that, but there, is, there, are, there are things we could learn from data, and even not big data, but the data in our marketing automation systems. You know, we can, we can learn a lot by 
you know, what our buyers are downloading on our website and okay. and sort of like how they're going through the journey with us. Um, it's just there's a whole lot of holes in that data. So it's insufficient, but it's okay as an add-on. Um, I would uh -huh. say where big data shines and where we're seeing the most – we have we do a lot of research for companies that are big data companies, and where we're seeing it used the most effectively is in those very low consideration buying decisions. Where gotcha. We, because okay. in that case, it's – you know, I always I, – in, in my keynote talk, I always say – in the difference between a low consideration and a buy consider, uh, high consideration marketing problem is if it's low consideration, it's all about the things I learned in school. It's all about product, price, place, and promotion, the four uh -huh. Ps. Remember that, Dave? Uh -huh. And Because, you know, if we're not on the right shelf in the grocery store at the right price and we haven't promoted our product properly then, and we don't have the right product, then we're not going to sell very much of it. But if it's as soon as we get just a little bit further down the consideration cycle, where it's a little bit higher consideration, it's about building trust with that buyer that they're going to um, do that. It's going to be okay if they buy from us. That they're not going to end up on a lousy vacation, or you know, sending their kids to the wrong college, or having this terrible long-term investment in capital equipment that's not going to serve their company well. And, mm -hmm. and it, that's about building a trusted relationship. And how does big data help us tell how to build a trusted relationship? It tells us it, where, it's, where it shines is in a you know, multi-channel environment, and the companies don't even have to use their internal data. Companies, you know, the big data companies are connecting all of this external data together that we don't even own, maybe, and making it available to us so that, you know, now if I want to sell my low consideration product online, I can get I can get the data to understand how to place an ad in that buyer's right in front of that buyer product price place and promotion a compelling ad in front of that buyer at the right price at the right time, etc. That's that's where big data is going to be perfect uh, in B two B higher consideration where I'm trying to build the buyer's trust and it's a longer consideration cycle, and buyers are really kind of weighing all the capabilities in depth, uh, then it's not enough to, to know what my marketing automation system tells me, which is what's the buyer doing. I really need to know why they're doing it. I really need – I just read an article on, H, on Harvard Business Review today talking about big data and talking about how there's uh, – the problem with big data is it doesn't tell you what causes the behavior. It, you can draw correlations, and as a matter of fact, the bigger the data set, the more correlations you can draw, and you can pretty much get the data to tell you anything you want it to say. Uh, but, and, and that's what makes it dangerous is yeah. because we can look at the data and make it, you know, and we all know this, we've all looked at so many surveys and so forth, and, and you know the company's making it say whatever they wanted it to say. Uh -huh. uh, but when we interview real buyers, we get into the why, and we get inside. I mean, people swear, and they get emotional, and, you know, I've had clients say to me, oh, come on, our buyer couldn't have been that worked up about, you know, our disaster recovery solution. Well, yes, they are. Here's the real quote from the interview. Huh. And, and, yeah, people are <laughs> – I, I followed – as a keynoter, I followed this guy who said, oh, here's marketing, boring, disaster recovery solution. So I'm like, wait a minute. Have you ever talked to an IT guy who had to restore a data center like in minutes or there's millions of customers? I mean, that, guy, that is not boring to that guy. No, no. Yeah, so it's each his own, <laughs> you, you know, get, and you, you never know. You get worked up about it, right? And, and you get that worked up kind of thing comes through in these interviews. No, absolutely. I always have to catch myself because I start getting all jazzed up about when I start talking about marketing, and I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm geeking out on the marketing stuff, but it, it does get me excited. And um, But that's, you know, to, you know, you never, you know, it, you know, like I just said earlier, teach his own. And, and everybody has their own interests and things that excite them and, and, and really piques their interest, and, that, and that's what you're saying to find out. And, and in regards to big data, you know, or it really only applies to a very teeny, teeny, tiny percentage of companies anyways. You know, the 99% of us, you know, have, you know, the small, medium businesses, which, you know, are the majority of the businesses out there. They're not going to even have that at their disposal. But I did want to 
talk about. I did want to talk about that with you because it was always it's just been intriguing because that's what you know. How how often have we heard that term over the years? And uh, now here comes you know this other methodology, and I was just curious how they played a part. But uh, mm -hmm. I, I I do think you've kind of added some clarity uh, with that. So. In regards to building these personas again, you know, to circle back, you know, we kind of digressed a little bit about the big data, but getting back to building these personas, uh, about how many people do you need it to talk to, to to gather enough insight? Well, that's this is the best news I'm going to share with this in this whole time we're talking, Dave, because people think that they have to do, you know, when people think about doing research, they think about huge data sets, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. Because in, in traditional, like in quantitative studies where we need statistical validity and we want to know, you know, that 45% of the people said X and 55 said Y, we need big samples. But in this is qualitative research. And in qualitative studies, you can work with, you can get insight from a relatively small sample. And so we have discovered over thousands of interviews and, th and hundreds of studies that if we have a homogenous group, you know, if we essentially are interviewing the same type of people around the same type of buying decision, then 10 interviews is all we need to get to insight. And there's such a diminishing uh, point of return for the 11th through the 20th interview that uh -huh. we just tell clients, look, we'll do as many interviews as you pay us to do, but you're wasting your money. And um, so, so 10 interviews. Now, the only ex the, the exception is, is if the clients want to know what's different between one part of the market than another. So if I've got a uh, disaster recovery solution, since we brought that up, and I think that there's something different about the way the finance industry looks at disaster recovery solutions compared to the retail industry, and I want to know what those differences are, then you're going to need at least six and ideally eight interviews in each of those just to see okay. what's, if there's really differences. But, you know, a typical study is, is 10 interviews is, is good. 10 interviews, but even as low as, you know, five or six will get you, get, get, get you on the right track or possibly get you on the right track. Is that, is that yeah. fair to say? You know, it, here's the thing I said in, in the book is, you know, if, you are in, if you're an in-house marketer and you're just trying to get to the point where you have some confidence that you're on the right track, do at least six interviews and then start working with that data. But then I also go on to say, but you need to do one interview a month for the rest of your life. Um, because you want to be able to, as an in-house marketer, you want to be able to credibly say to the company that you are doing these interviews regularly and this is the people, you know, when somebody questions you on something you say, you want to be able to say, well, we talk to people every month and this is what they told us. Mm -hmm. So. Um, as an in-house marketer, that would be the truth. Now, if you're, if you're an agency or like for our studies when we're doing this work for clients, I would highly recommend 10 uh, just okay. to get to – because you're probably going to be in this and leave again. And, uh, and also because, you know, there, there will be variances just across, um, you know, getting the perfect people on the phone and having them be as open as you want to be – want them to be with you. So we – that's what we recommend is 10. Okay. Now, what do you do if you are an in-house marketer or a, an agency and either your boss or the owner of the company is a little hesitant to let you talk to their clients? Do you have any advice on how to deal with situations like that? Well, you know, it's, it's, as an in-house marketer, I'd approach it a little differently than I would as an agency. As an in-house marketer, I would say to the company, I would say to my boss, look, you know, our salespeople um, are trained and to go out and listen to prospects before they ever try to pitch our solution. As a matter of fact, we tell them, don't go in there with a pitch until you get to go through a, dis they could do a discovery call, salespeople call it and understand what's important to that customer. And, and so, you know, the salespeople are, getting, are collecting data, and that allows them to, fa to formulate a compelling story for that prospect that's going to make them want to buy from us. Now, the salesperson is trying to persuade one buyer at a time. I'm trying to persuade a market full of buyers. And I never get a chance 
to listen before I have to talk. If, unless we're going to tell the salespeople, listen, forget all that, just quit, quit having discovery calls, then I don't know why you expect me to be effective doing persuasive marketing activities without doing discovery first. And that's all we're doing. Um, okay. We're just, we're just, when we build a buyer persona, we're establishing for a market full of buyers the same kind of insight that a salesperson collects one buyer at a time in a prospect call. Only we're doing it more successfully, frankly, because buyers won't open up as much to the salesperson as they will to us if we do this correctly. Now, what now, if you're an agency? If you're an agency, it's a little different because, you know, you've got sort of an arm's length relationship. So what I recommend there, and I talk about it in, at length in the book, is is that you say to the account, okay, well, I need to understand your buyers, and you can say something similar about I need, you know, I need to be able to develop a persuasive marketing strategy, and I need to know what your buyers are thinking. Usually the client will say, um, well, we already know our buyers. Well, great. Please, I, I, need, I need that information. Help me get on the phone with and talk to somebody in your company who's a buyer expert. And then once I get on that call, I, I suggest, that you interview that person, tell them, look, you know, to help me out, I want you to go and roll here, and I want to do a role play, and I'm going to interview you as if you were a real buyer. Okay. And, and that allows you to then put that person in the position of talking as if they were a buyer, and um, first of all, they're going to get to experience the kind of interviews you want to conduct, which is a really interesting experience for them because they start to go, oh, wow, this is something different than I would have thought about doing. And the other thing that happens is when those people start giving you what I call the vendor happy talk, called, uh -huh. oh, yeah, and then I, you know, I want a solution that does X, and this is what matters about this, and this is what matters about that. And I start, I, I'll actually stop the person and say, wait a minute, is that how all your buyers think? Because if they all thought that way, you must be winning every single deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and what what are and, some of the reactions you've gotten? Oh, and well, I mean, they immediately go, "Oh, you're right," and now they start to either recognize once again that they're really not, they don't really have the knowledge to share with you, mm -hmm. or and they start to realize how real this is. You know, like these people are talking about something here different in terms of a you know a buyer persona than what I thought it was, mm -hmm. and um, and they'll and they'll either start to get more open with you, or they'll at least start to. Uh, see that why you need to go do these interviews. Gotcha. And, and I assume an in-house person can do the same tactic because that just feels like if you have a roadblock, just talk mm -hmm. to that roadblock and interview them, do the role playing, and then when you catch them, basically touting their features and benefits, and just say, well, is that if that's how everybody thinks, you know, you should never lose a sale. And then that kind of light bulb goes off. It sounds like at that point. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, because that's, yeah, that's yeah. something that I'm, I'm yeah. you know, having some resistance uh, with that right now, and I think it's just more of a, oh, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to, you know, mess up our relationships with our clients, but I think getting them to really see the value will overcome that, will, you know, overshadow that fear, so to speak, um, it sounds like. And it's, I mean, you, you've done this countless times. Is that is that kind of what yeah, normally exactly. happens? exactly. Exactly. Gotcha. Well, yeah, we we don't really encounter it quite the same as ways because we don't do we're not an agency, but uh -huh. um, but I've I've done it back in my career back in the days when you know I spent 30 years basically doing this kind of work as an in-house marketer when I was or when I was running marketing for for uh, 15 years, and uh -huh. you know inevitably there's a sense that we know our buyers or the salespeople know our buyers and. Especially when we're a third party, we have to be very careful about going in and saying, well, no, you don't. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's really hard to say that. So how do we do that politely? We call their bluff. We say, great, you know your buyers. Let's, you know, help me know the buyer. Yeah. No, I, I, that's amazing advice um, for everybody, but uh, personally, for me to you, thank you <laughs> for that, because I think that's going to that's gonna help me kind of get over couple of stumbling blocks I'm having uh, personally, but I, I know because I know the importance of it, and um, I, I'm just trying to convince them of the importance of it and want to kind of break down those walls. And I think that's that's going to be my tactic is just let me talk to your main salesperson or whomever and interview them, and then, I, you know, hopefully the uh, 
the realization comes out. Well, cool. Well, awesome. Well, I, I think we have covered a ton here today, and uh, I think you've really given some clarity uh, and, and sold the importance of buyer profiles. Do you have any, any parting thoughts um, before I let you go? Yeah, you know, it's just, uh, you know, this is a really uh, popular idea. Buyer personas are a popular idea. Everybody uh, feels like this is a good thing to do. Uh, I think the main thing is to figure, is to just to decide how much you're going, energy you're going to invest in this. And uh, if, if, if the idea is, is, you know, we're going to get a template, we're just going to interview people internally, and we're going to write down what we, what we know, the benefit of that is that we start to have a company-wide uh, shared understanding of what we know. But I will mm-hmm. tell you this. Out of all the studies we've done, uh, every single study, when we've actually gone out and interviewed real buyers, we've uncovered things that were quite unsettling, that were quite different than what the company thought was true about what their buyers were thinking. And it's, it's, it, 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 this isn't a criticism. It's the fact is when we live inside the four walls and we sit in meetings all day talking about, we know so much. We know the truth. We know what our products really do and we know what our products really don't do. What we can never know is what the perceptions are of what we do and what we don't do. And as marketers, what matters is perception. So I, I, I sometimes say, you know, we're too caught up in reality and, uh, in fact, the buyer's reality and our reality, there is 100% of the time there is a mismatch there. And, and this can be, it can be an incredible source of competitive advantage to know what that mismatch is. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Um, how can people continue to learn from you, Adele? Well, I, uh, I blog at buyerpersona.com. And also have a Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash buyer persona. And uh, would love to, and I'm on Twitter at buyer persona. I'm, I'm pretty much the buyer persona <laughs> person. So. It sounds like it. <laughs> and of course, the book, uh, which is available at Amazon or Barnes and Noble. And, and uh, would just, and I love to hear from people. I mean, I love, I, we, I accept emails. I, I try to answer every email I get and, and really help people get educated about this idea because I'm very passionate about helping people become buyer experts. Well, uh, and I think there's many others who uh, share that share that passion. So, yeah, everyone out there, definitely go and, and basically just type in buyer persona on, on, on any platform and you'll find Adele. Well, thank you very much, Adele, and I look forward to talking with you next time um, about uh, specifically how people can use all the buyer personas uh, on specific levels, uh, be it digital uh, or, you know, sales, marketing, alignment, all of that stuff. So we'll, we'll dig into that next time. But thank you so much, and, I, you know, look forward to speaking with you again down the road. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Bye-bye.